Central Adelaide boasts almost 1,800 acres of parks, less than Canberra, but a great deal more than most other cities of its size. As so often in Australia, they reflect an effort to recreate a familiarly, familiarly British ambience in an antipodian setting. Of all the things people longed for when they first came to Australia, an English backdrop was perhaps the most outstanding. It is notable when you look at early paintings of the country, how awkward, how strikingly un-Australian the landscape so often appears. Even the gum trees look unusually lush and globular, as if art the artists were willing them to take on a more English aspect. Australia was a disappointment to the early settlers. They ached for English air and English vistas. So when they built their cities, they laid them out with rolling English-style parks arrayed with stands of oak, beech, chestnut, and elm in a way that recalled the dreamily bucolic efforts of Humphrey Repton or Capability Brown. Capability Brown. Adelaide is the driest city in the driest state in the driest continent, but you would never guess it from wandering through its parks. Here it is forever Sussex. Unfortunately, such arrangements are out of fashion in the horticultural world. Since many of the original plantings are now coming to the end of their natural lives, the park authorities have instituted plans to sweep away the intruder species and recreate a riverine landscape dominated by Mali scrub and red river gums of the sort that existed here naturally before Europeans came along. Heartwarming thought it, it is to see Australians taking pride in their native flora. The plan seems unfortunate, so say to say the least. To begin with, Australia has several hundred thousand square miles of landscape featuring Mali scrub and Red River gums. It is not as if this is a threatened environment. Worse. The parks as they are now are unusually fine among the best in the world and it would be tragedy to lose them wherever they are. If you accept the logic that they are inappropriate because they are in a European style, then clearly you would have to get rid of all of Adelaide's houses, streets, buildings and European derived European derived people. Unfortunately, as so often in a short sighted world, no one asked me about any of this. Still, the parks remain lovely for the moment and I was happy to pass into them now. They were packed with large family groups enjoying Australia Day, picnicking and playing cricket with tennis balls. Adelaide has miles of good beaches in its western suburbs, so it surprised me that such numbers of people had forsaken the shore to come into the city. It gave the day an engagingly old-fashioned air. This is how we spent the 4th of July when I was a kid in Iowa, in parks playing ball games. It seemed odd too, but again pleasing that in a country of so much space, people chose to crowd together to relax. Perhaps it's all that intimate, intimidating emptiness that makes Australians such social creatures. The parks were so crowded, in fact, that it was so it was often impossible to tell which ball game belonged to which group of onlookers 
or even sometimes which field does belong to which ball game. When a ball bounced into a neighboring party, as seemed to happen quite regularly, there was always an exchange of apologies on the one hand and a call of no worries on the other, as the ball was tossed back in into party. It was effectively all one very large picnic, and I felt almost ridiculously pleased to be part of it even in such a marginal way. It took about three hours, I suppose, to do the complete circuit of the parks. Quite often, a roar would rise from the oval. Cricket was obviously a livelier spectacle in person than on the radio. At length, I emerged onto a street called Pennington Terrace, where a row of neat blue stone houses with shady lawns overlooked the oval. At one, fam at one, a family had essentially moved its living room onto the front lawn. I know it can't have been, but in my recollection they had brought out everything. Floor lamps, coffee table, area rug, magazine basket, coal scuttle. They had certainly brought out a sofa and a television on which they were watching the cricket. Behind the television, a couple of hundred yards away across the across open parkland, stood the oval, so that whenever anything dramatic happened on their screen, it was accompanied in real time by a roar from the stadium just beyond. Who's winning? I called as I walked past. Bloody poems. The man said, inviting me to share his amazement. I touched on uphill past the imposing husk hulk of St. Peter's Cathedral. I was heading in a general way toward my hotel, intending to have a shower and a change of clothes before setting off to look for a pub and dinner. Out of the shade of the parks, it was a blisteringly hot afternoon, and I was by now quite footsore, but I found myself drawn helplessly into the residential streets of North Adelaide. It was an area of quiet prosperity, settled under a Sunday serenity, with street after street of old houses, each buried under roses and frangipani and every little plot a model of meticulously managed floral abundance. At length I arrived at a place called Wellington Square, an open space overlooked by a grand pub of venerable aspect. I went straight over. Inside it was cool and convivial with gleaming fittings and a lot of people, a lot of polished wood. Nothing like the austere pubs of the bush. This was a place for cocktails for talking about one's investment portfolio. It was busy too, though most of the customers were eating rather than drinking, or at least eating as well as drinking. At nearly every table they were they were, they were hunched over steaks or battered portions of fish so hearty that they hung over the edge of the plates. On a large pull-down screen, the cricket was showing, but was the sound turned down. I had found my home for the evening. I ordered a pint of Cooper's Drought and retired with it to a table overlooking the square and there I sat for a good few minutes, doing nothing at all, not even touching my glass, just savoring the pleasure of sitting down and finding myself in a far country with a glass of beer and cricket on the TV and a room full of people enjoying the fruits of prosperous age. I could not have been happier. After a 
while I remembered my purchases from the second-hand bookshop and pulled them out for examination. I turned first to Australian Paradox, an account of a year-long stay in a country in 1959 to 1960, written by an English journalist named Jean Mackenzie and crafted open, interested to see how Australia today compared with the Australia of 40 years ago. Well, what a different world it was. The Australia Miss Mackenzie describes is a place of boundless prosperity, full employment, twinkling wholesomeness, and infinite optimism. In 1959 to 60, Australia was the third wealthiest country on the planet. I hadn't realized this, exceeded only by the United States and Canada. But what was particularly interesting was how modest were the components of material, well, material well-being back then. With adm admiration bordering on amazement, Miss Mackenzie notes that by the end of the 1950s, three quarters of city dwellers in Australia had a refrigerator and almost half had a washing machine. There wasn't yet enough electricity in most rural areas to run big appliances, so they didn't count. Nearly every home in the nation, she went on, had at least one radio. Gosh! and most homes have other electrical appliances such as vacuum cleaners, irons, and electric jugs. Oh, to live in a world in which the own ownership of an electric jug is a source of pride. I spent a good hour reading through the book at random, spellbound by the simplicity of the age she described. In 1960, television was still an exciting novelty. It didn't reach Australia until 1956 and then only in Sydney and Melbourne at first. Colour television, a distant dream. In Melbourne, on Sundays, there were no newspapers and movie theatres and pubs were shut by law. Perth was still at the end of a very long dirt road and would remain so remain so for many years. Adelaide was just half the size it is now and its famous festival was then brand new. Queensland was backward, still is. Even in the best restaurants, chicken, Mar Maryland and beef stroganoff were dishes of exotic distinction, and oysters were served with ketchup. For most people, foreign cuisine began and ended with spaghetti out of cans. Cheese came in two varieties, sharp and tasty. Supermarkets were a new and exciting concept. 5% of college age kids in 1959 were actually in college. This also reported with admiration, up from 1.56% 20 years before. It was in every way a different world. What struck me in all this was not how much better off Australians are today, but how much worse they feel. One of the oddest things for an outsider to do is watch Australians assessing themselves. They are an extraordinarily self-critical people. You encounter it constantly in newspapers and on television and radio. A nagging conviction that no matter how good things are in Australia, they are bound to be better elsewhere. A curiously large proportion of books on Australian life and history bear grave, pessimistic titles. Among the barbarians, the future eaters, the tyranny of distance, 
this tired brown land fatal impact the fatal shore even when the titles are neutral they're never positive they often contain the oddest most startling conclusions in a shorter history of australia a thoughtful and unexceptionable survey of the country's considerable achievements over the past 200 years the author jeffrey blaney finishes by noting that australia has nearly completed its first century under peaceful federation then out of the blue he concludes with the, with these words whether it will last for two centuries is not certain in a sweep of human history no political boundary is permanent now is that very strange or what you could understand a canadian writing those words or belgian or south africa but an australian please this is a country that has never had a serious civil disturbance never jailed a dissident dissident never shown the tiniest inclination to fray at the edges australia is the norway of the south uh, southern hemisphere and yet here is the country's foremost living historian suggesting that its continuation as a so sovereign nation is by no means assured extraordinary if australians lack one thing in their lonely eminence down under it is perspective for four decades they have watched in quiet dismay as one country after another switzerland sweden japan kuwait and many others have climbed over them on the per capita gdp table when news came out in 1996 that hong kong and singapore had also squeezed ahead you'd have thought from the newspaper editorials and analysis that asian armies had come ashore somewhere around darwin and were fanning out across the country appropriating consumer durables as they went never mind that most of these countries were only marginally ahead and that much of it was to do with relative exchange rates never mind that when you take into account quality of life indicators like cost of living educational attainments crime rates and so on australia bounced back up near the top it ranks seventh on the united nations human development index a little behind canada sweden the united states and one or two others but comfortably ahead of germany switzerland austria italy and several other countries with stout economics and higher gdps at the time of my visit australia was booming as never before it was enjoying one of the fastest rates of economic growth in the in a developed world inflation was invisible unemployment was at its lowest level in years yet according to a study by the australian institute 36 percent of australians felt life was getting worse and barely a fifth so any hope of it's getting better these days it is true in terms of gross dollars accumulated per head australia is no longer near the top it comes in at number 21 in fact but i ask you which would you rather be third richest and thrilled because you have an electric jug and at least one radio or 21st richest and living in a world where, where you can have everything a person could reasonably want? On the other hand, in very few of these other countries do you run the slightest risk of being eaten by an estuarine crocodile, a thought that occurred to me now I pulled out my second purchase crocodile attack in Australia by Hugh Edwards and waded chest deep into its 
240 pages of gruesome, violent attacks by this most cunning and unsporting of creatures. The saltwater crocodile is the one animal that has the capacity to frighten even Australians. People who would calmly flick a scorpion off their forearm or chuckle fearlessly at the pack of skulking dingoes will quake at the sight of a hungry croc. And I had not ventured far into the pages of Mr. Edwards' chilling chronicles before I began to understand why. Consider this tale of an afternoon at play in northwestern Australia. In March 1987, a yacht with five people aboard was making its way along the Kimberley coast when it detoured up the Prince Regent River to visit King's Cascade, a remote beauty spot where a tropical waterfall spills picturesquely over a granite outcrop. There they moored away, moored and went off variously to clamber over the cascades or have a swim. One of the swimmers was a young American model named Ginger Faye Meadows. As she and other young women stood weight, waist deep on a rock ledge under the waterfall, one of them noticed the cold steady eyes and half submerged snout of a crocodile coming toward them. Now imagine it. you are standing with your back to a rock wall, much too steep and slippery to climb with nowhere to retreat and one of the deadliest creatures on earth is coming toward you. A creature so perfectly engineered to kill that it has scarcely changed in 200 million years. You are, in short, about to be killed by something from the age of the dinosaurs. One of the two women took off a plastic shoe and threw it at the crocodile. It bounced off his head, causing him to blink and hesitate. In the same instant, Meadows decided to make a break for it. She dove into the water and tried to swim the 25 yards to safety. The friend stayed put. Meadows swam with strong strokes, but the crocodile followed on a line designed to intercept her. About halfway across, it caught her around the middle and jerked her beneath the water. According to the boat's skipper, Meadows stayed under for stayed under for several seconds, then surfaced with her hands in the air and a really startled look on her face. She was looking right at me, but she didn't say a word. Then she went under again and was seen no more. The next day would have been her twenty-fifth birthday. This is probably the most famous crocodile attack in Australia in the last 25 years because it involved a well-known beauty spot, a luxurious cruiser, and a victim from America who happened to be young and very good looking. But here's the thing, there have been lots of others, perhaps as many as 150 in a century according to Mr. Edwards. What's more, Meadows' death was atypical because she saw it coming. For most people, a crocodile attack comes completely unexpectedly. The chronicles of crocodile killings are full of stories of people standing in a few inches of water or sitting on a bank or strolling along an ocean beach when suddenly the water splits and before they can even cry out, much less enter into negotiations, they are carried away for leisurely devouring. That is what is so scary about them. 
Now I ask you, who gives a damn how much money people are making in Hong Kong or Singapore when you've got matters like that to worry about? That's all I'm saying.